Okay, thank you, uh, Dorian. So uh, this talk I know is titled uh, Tips for New and Future Professors. I guess it's, it's valid for any, any professors, right? But originally it was planned for, for new people. Anyway, let's see how it goes. Uh, most of you, I guess, know who I am. Uh, I've taught some, a lot of you. Uh, and um, like I said, like Dorian said, although I, I, I teach in the faculty, but I also uh, coach squash for many years and also teach Tai Chi for many years. You learn a lot from teaching other things. I would say a lot of the teaching techniques or tips actually comes from teaching Tai Chi or teaching coaching squash. It's not much of a difference, actually. Actually, you learn a lot from coaching, right? It's like teaching, but it's a bit different. Um, okay, so let's start. So teaching is a skill, okay? And it can be learned. I don't think anybody is really a born teacher. Teaching is not something you're born with. You have to work at it, right? Okay? So, like I said, most university teachers do not get any training in teaching. You don't take a course, you don't get a degree in teaching before you become a university professor. You want to be a high school teacher, well, yeah, you need a degree in education. You want to be a college teacher, you need to get a bachelor in vocational education or something. But you, to be a university professor, you don't need any of this. Which is very strange in a way, right? So basically, if you want to be good, you have to teach yourself. Or you have to look at how other people teach. So, if you want to be effective, right, you must learn how to do it. Okay? <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to present 12 teaching tips. It just happened to be 12. I didn't make it up. Just so when I start counting it up, it happened to be 12. It sounds like a nice number. So hopefully these 12 tips will help you uh, with your teaching. Uh, you should enhance interest. And also understanding and retention. Retention is key as well, right? Now, uh, like I said, the, the tips are based on my uh, teaching experience. I've taught many parts of the world, uh, short courses, long courses, you name it. Teaching different types of things. <coughs> coaching squash, coaching teaching Tai Chi, and uh, other things. And obviously, the caveat is that it doesn't work for everybody. You know, this might work for me or for most people, but it may not work for everybody. The other thing also is that when I present the tips, I also have put some references. Uh, it just so happened that I found references that sort of collaborate what I say, right? And uh, also, some of the references in fact, are based on uh, research that are done very recently. So I brought them along, some of the books. Like this one is uh, 2010 on how learning works, how teaching and learning works. And there's another one which is 2014 is uh, make it stick. How do you teach so that it sticks in your head, right? And a lot of this is actually based on very recent research. And I have some papers here, uh, recent as 2013, that talks about how you learn and how you teach, okay? So everybody, is, please, uh, if you want, you can borrow them. Now, <coughs> okay. So if you want to be a great teacher, I'm not saying that I'm a great teacher. I'm still learning, okay? You need to observe and study how good teachers teach. It's like when we coach squash, the first thing we tell our players is that watch the good players play, right? See, look, look at their technique, how they do their back and how they do the forehead, right? Try to imitate them. So I guess it's the same with teaching. You have to watch how good teachers teach. Now, if you're shy to go into a class, and watch somebody teach, maybe you can recall your good teachers, or you can go on YouTube these days, right? <coughs> if, you, if you go on YouTube, like uh, uh, MIT, for example, they have a lot of their courses on, on video. I mean, they have very good professors. See how they teach, right? How they, how they interact with students, how they uh, handle the board, and all this stuff. Just, I mean, you can just watch it in your privacy, your own home. Also, you need to study the literature on teaching. <coughs> just, just don't just watch, right? Study. You need to study. There are lots of research. Like I said, there are lots of research on on uh, teaching and learning effectively. So, if you want to improve yourself, you have to study. 
You have to do some research yourself. Also, of course, you have to have a desire to be a good teacher, right? If you don't want to be a good teacher, well, well nobody can help you. Now, also, you need to be willing to consistently and deliberately work on your teaching. So here's a graph that shows uh, over time, right? <coughs> Some people might just say, uh, uh, try it and then it's good enough and just stay on the amateur level. But if you want to be an expert, you have to keep working at it, right? You can only get better as you work on it. Okay, first tip. Well, some of these tips are basically common sense in a way, right? Not very common sometimes. So the first thing is, obviously, you need to be well prepared. Get your, your course outline ready, course notes ready, and you know exactly what to do in class, okay? You have to be organized, so you know exactly when to do what. Obviously, you need to be confident. Even if you're not, you have to show that you're confident. Nothing is, you have to be yourself, right? Don't try to be somebody else. Be flexible and relax. So, first tip is pretty general, uh, generic, I would say, but not easily achieved. Especially if you're doing it for the first time, you're facing the class for the first time, most people are really, really nervous, right? So, preparation is the key. Now, next tip. Don't teach too much. In fact, when I started teaching, I asked my, my own uh, supervisor, who's a really great teacher, I asked him and said, is there any tips? That's the only, only tip he gave me, don't teach too much. Right? So what you want to do is teach less, but do it profoundly. So aim not to cover the subject, but to uncover part of it. Right? There's no point covering like uh, 10 different techniques doing the same thing, and then they don't really know what, what, what they are for, right? Sometimes it's better to do one or two techniques that you do really well, right? So it's important to uh, not to teach too much. That is one of the most common faults among uh, new, new teachers, tend to teach too much, okay? It's better to teach less and have a lot more time for discussion than to teach too much and rush through the, the lecture. So, if you teach too much, nobody process your the information anyway. Now, like I have reference one here. Reference one, in fact, is one of the oldest references that I have. This is uh, actually written uh, as a manual for new teachers and for uh, for professors at MIT. This is from 1959. <coughs> you and your students. This is a really, really great advice. So, like I said, if you want to borrow it, just let me know. <clears throat> Next thing, put things in context. <clears throat> so, it's important to know what the students, where they came from, what they know, right, before that topic. So you need to tell them how it's linked to the present topic, and then eventually how it's linked to the next topic. So you have to link the past, the present, and the future. So context is very important. You need to tell them what is this all about, right? The big picture. So like there's a quote, for me, context is the key. Right? Everything, everything, everything else uh, can be understood if you know the context. Again, you see that in, in the references as well. It's very important to put things in context the big picture, right? If you don't know why you're teaching that topic or why you're studying that topic or that subject, it's very hard for them to understand why they, they need to be in class and listen to you, right? So you need the, the big picture. <coughs> Tip number four is repetition. <coughs> now, so it's important to repeat the same point several times, maybe in a, using different words or different example, different analogy. They may not get it the first time, but the second or third time they might get it, right? Some people take time to process. Now, here I say use the tree by tree method. In fact, this method is, is the way we teach Tai Chi. And this is handed down from the master, right? 
after years and years of experience teaching Tai Chi. Three by three in Tai Chi, when we teach three by three means you show the move three times and then you do it together with the students three times and then the students do it themselves three times, right? And if it's not enough, we repeat again. So it's very important that you demonstrate first without them doing anything. Uh, the worst part is when you're doing the move, they are following you. Then you can't see what they're doing, right? And they're doing it wrong. So the best that when you are demonstrating it, they pay full attention to you and don't do anything. Don't move a muscle, just watch and observe. So same thing I would say in teaching is, you know, you do three examples. I normally do a simple, very trivial example that everybody would get it. And then you move into deeper levels. And then you do another three examples maybe with the students, guiding them along. And then finally, you give them problems to solve on their own. So whether it's Tai Chi or teaching Tai Chi or teaching, I would say the same principles apply. <coughs> Uh, tip number five, have a good sense of humor. This is really difficult. Some people have no sense of humor, as you know, right? Some students have no sense of humor, but usually most prof, when they are new, they may be very funny guys, but when they are in class, they start to panic, right? So it's not easy. Uh, many years ago, we have a prof here. In fact, it's very, very strict in the class, right? So it's, it's almost like uh, this teacher here. No talking, no laughing, no smiling, no breathing, right? <laughs> Just like, you know, nobody to move a muscle. I mean, uh, obviously that is not very good. So, maintaining a good sense of humor is always important. It relaxes the class, show that you're approachable, makes students feel uh, attentive, I think. They will come to classes to listen to you, but listen to your jokes, hopefully. And it shows that you're human, right? Not easily developed, but over time you can do that. Number six, this is key. Use active learning techniques. What does it mean? So you have to keep the student engaged. That means that you have to constantly ask questions. Get them to answer you. Now, one of the most effective techniques that I use, or which I learned, I would say, by reading a paper many years ago, uh, is to give multiple choice quizzes uh, for instant assessment. I'll show you an example. Okay? So that means that once in a while you throw up a question, give them multiple choice answer, and then uh, they work on the problem, and then, anyway, I'll show you. Okay. Uh, another technique uh, that has been useful is called use peer instruction. Peer instruction, in fact, I mean, a lot of us use peer instruction. That means you get students to teach other students. So peer instruction can be built into that instant assessment thing, okay? Which I'll explain in a while. Peer instruction, in fact, is a term that was coined by uh, Eric Manso from Harvard. And he, he developed this technique. I don't, I don't know why he, he... Anyway, he wrote papers about it and did all kind of experiment and, and uh, did all kind of evaluation on this technique. It's about more than 10 years old now. And it's a very popular technique to copy the instruction. Teaching students, teaching other students how to do problems. I didn't even know it was called peer instruction because we've been using it for, for a long time. And I have to read it up and say, oh, it's called peer instruction. And also use formative assessment. <coughs> That's a definition. Basically, you're providing feedback. <coughs> so this is, this is very common in, in coaching, right? If you don't provide feedback, you don't make corrective actions, they will never learn as well. So it's important that you, you provide that feedback all the time, right? There's no point giving a test and then you never mark the assignments and then at the end of the exam, you say, yeah, here it is, right? By then, it's too late. You don't know what they've, where they've gone wrong. So providing constant feedback is important. <coughs> it's like coaching squash, right? You get them to do the forehand 100 times, but each time is all over the place. Well, you have to see what's going on, right? Maybe the angle of the record is wrong. Maybe the timing is wrong. 
point where they hit the ball as well. <coughs> so we have to provide that kind of feedback, immediate feedback. <coughs> now, what I like to use is this instant assessment technique, which is uh, basically one <coughs> called low cost clicker. You get a card like this, and you fold it up, A, B, C, D. So you pose a question like this. So those people in fluid mechanic will know how to solve this problem. So I'll give you five minutes and uh, try to solve this problem, part A. So after five minutes, I say, okay, show me your answer. So every student would have one of this and say, okay, it's, you know, A, maybe. <clears throat> so in one glance, I can see who got it right, who got it wrong. Then I can always say, okay, you got it right. Maybe you can show the rest of the class how it's done, right? Okay? I always pick on students. And if somebody got it wrong, well, you can find out from that person who got it right how it's done. So this is a peer instruction place, uh, peer instruction part. So I, I find this technique very useful. Again, this, this technique it wasn't invented by me. It was a paper in 1995 by, uh, by uh, Meta. <coughs> Happened to read it and I've been using that for every, most of my classes. <coughs> so, but the only thing is that you need to prepare all these questions ahead of time. Before. So after a certain topic, I would have all those questions, show the questions, try to get feedback. So they, the students are always on their toes because you, they know that I'm going to ask a question. Tip number seven, well this was an se entire separate talk that I've done before, is learning how to learn. So, not only you need to teach well, but you need to tell them how to learn well, right? So, you have to teach your student how to take notes properly, and also how to study. Now, luckily, according to uh, lots of research, there's only two things you need to do. <clears throat> One is plan your study period, called distributed practice. Spread your study period over time, short periods over time. And the second uh, technique is constant testing. Always asking yourself questions. Actually, like I said, there's a big study done on, on how to study. And basically, they all came up with only two things that are effective. Distributed practice and constant self-testing. The worst technique is highlighting and rereading. That's the most common technique used by students, but that's the worst technique according to research. Okay? Also, they have shown that if you force students to recall information, they learn it better. So, in fact, uh, <coughs> this is a tip number eight. <coughs> lots of practice. Provide lots of practice problems. I normally provide fully work up solutions, which I give out data. You set problems for deliberate practice. Deliberate practice, again, is a technical term. There are lots of papers written about deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is the technique where you can get, you can reach expert level performance. And deliberate practice are the things that you hate to do. For example, if you are a pianist, just going to the piano and playing a few melodies, you will <coughs> never be an expert. That's why you're forced to do scales, right? Day in, day out, in hours of scale. Why do you do that? You hate that, but it's because you want to attain expert performance. So playing squat, you have to do drills. You do hours of drills. It's not playing games, it's playing drills. Drills are tough, right? So same thing here, you have to provide enough examples so that they can drill. Now, another thing is also like providing constant quizzes. Low stake quizzes, no stakes. I mean, there's, there's no marks involved, right? Or very little marks involved, but you're always quizzing them. So, people have done, there are lots of references about this. 
they've done studies where they take two groups of students. One group, both groups are asked to read certain chapters. But one group was tested. The other group wasn't. So this group that was tested, are forced, of course, forced to retrieve information from what they have read, right? Now, months later, they retest the students. The group that was tested always performed better than the, test, than the other group that was just reading it. Right? So I get a lot of research has been done on this kind of stuff. So, so it's important that you force mm -hmm. them to retrieve information from the brains, right? That's why constant quizzes, constant testing, costing us asking questions is important. <coughs> Well, project your voice. Don't talk to yourself, right? I know some people like to uh, mumble to themselves. So. so, this is something that you have to practice. Uh, speak loud and clear, walk around the class, make eye contact, <coughs> always look at somebody, especially those who are going to fall asleep, and then pick on them. <coughs> if possible, get to know the student's name. As you get older, it gets harder and harder, of course, to remember Syrian's name. <clears throat> Tip number 10, open uh, suggestion. I mean, nobody's perfect, so you have to uh, listen to feedback from your students, from other people uh, willing to learn, of course, and treat student respect, right? There are a lot of students who are a lot smarter than you anyway. Right? So you, Sometimes you, you just have to be uh, a bit more humble yourself. Just because you have a PhD or what doesn't mean you're smart. Right? <coughs> Number 11, takes responsibility. <coughs> it's like the dog there, you know? He does his business, he cleaned it up for himself. So, you may be at fault if the students don't do well. Right? Sometimes it's easy to blame on a student, but maybe it's yourself. Because you're lousy. That's it, right? <clears throat> so you have to be, you have to self-assess yourself. Why are the students doing so bad? <clears throat> so it's not always the student's fault. Right? You need to reflect your own teaching. And hopefully you can do better next time. <clears throat> I mentioned this before, be a student of teaching, right? Observe and learn from good teachers. <coughs> <coughs> Study the literature on good teaching. Okay, there are lots of references, there are lots of good research and uh, papers or books on teaching. You don't, have, you don't need to get an education degree, right? To be a good teacher. Like, there are lots of research already out there that you can study. You can, uh, learn and study. Bad teachers can also be good teachers. Sometimes you learn the best from really bad teachers, right? You tell them, I'll oh, never do that, you know? Things like that, right? <coughs> so, uh, so, you can learn from good and bad teachers. Put yourself in the shoes, in their shoes, the students' shoes, I mean. <coughs> I mean, if you are the student, what do you want to know, right? How would you like your prof to behave? So, humility goes a long way, of course. <coughs> so, just to summarize the 12 tips. One is, obviously, be prepared. The second one, to me, is the, to me, is the most important. Don't teach too much. But teach, whatever you teach, teach it really well. Right? Put things in context. Very important. Why are you teaching it? Why are you teaching a subject? And linking present, future, and the past. Right? You need to you need to know what they have, where they came from. What what do they know now? What have they done? How many the causes they have done in the past? Right? How you link that? Repetition. It's always good to repeat stuff. Review stuff, uh, have a good sense of humor. Everybody can do with more of that. Uh, use active learning techniques. Like I said, there are many simple techniques that you could use. 
right, to engage the student. Number seven, teach them how to study. It's very important that not only listening to you, but how they would study on their own, right? Provide lots of practice so that they have a chance to absorb the material, project your voice, open the suggestions, and take responsibility and be a student of teaching. Pretty simple. <coughs> so, I, uh, I've listed the references here. I brought some of them. So if you are interested in uh, some of the references, like I said, you can get from me. So the first one, like I said, that's the oldest one. That is, I, I find that very, very useful. Very simple note from MIT for, for, for all their teachers, right? So that's really good. Uh, the second one is about peer instruction. Like I did a lot of studies of peer instruction. I was using it, I didn't even know that it's called peer instruction. Um, the third one, instant assessment. That's the one using these cuts, right? That was published in the Journal of uh, Engineering Education. So Damlowski, that one, that is a big study. In fact, that, is, that, that version is a Scientific American Mind version, which is a summarized version of the big study. In fact, the, the, the big study is uh, huge, okay? It's a big study, that was, but it was summarized it was summarized in uh, in Scientific American into a few pages. <coughs> There's also uh, the book. This is a fairly new book. Again, that summarizes a lot of research that has gone on in the past. <coughs> and this one in 2010, again, about teaching and how. Um, Research-based principles on smart teaching. Again, fairly new book. Right? So, if anybody wants to borrow them, you can borrow them for free, no charge. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs>